So today we're going to be talking about urban trees and biochar uh, in both Stockholm and Montpelier, Vermont. Stockholm, Sweden, Montpelier, Vermont. Um, this so the reason why we're talking about it is um, there are certain pressures on on urban trees, and this is an example here. This is a photo that I took um, earlier this year that shows a few trees that kind of illustrates the issues with urban tree planting. Um, on the left, you have the largest one, and in the middle, the medium one, and then on the far right, you can have the, you have the smallest one. So this is pretty uh, pretty indicative of the pavement. As you can see on the bottom here, this white painted area, it actually, like if that was all covered with grass, this this planting bed would be a rectangle. And so each one of these would have roughly the same amount of space. But it's actually a triangular green strip. The one that has the least and the least green and the most pavement around it is the smallest. And let's be honest, this is what most of our street trees look like. Um, the one in the middle, of course, has a little bit more and, and the tree roots are able to overlap underground to some extent. So this tree will get some benefit from the soil that it also shares with this tree, but none of them have as much as this one. And I just think it's interesting the way the trees grow differently, not only in size, but um, the structure of them is this the the outer twigging of this or the ramification is much more complex and even and elongated uh, than this is. But the soil is not removed in order to pave, right? We don't dig out the soil and 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 fill up four feet deep with pavement. So the soil is still there, but. I'm going to try to go over why I think it's not so much available to the trees. So we're going to look here. These are just some any hand drawn sketches in this are just sketches that I did. So hyd hydrotropism is a characteristic of roots. Uh, hydrotropism modifies root growth to respond to a water potential gradient in soil and grow towards areas with a higher moisture content. So the way to think about it would be water pulls roots. So this is what I was trying to capture here is. This root starting over here in this dry area. A little bit wetter, a little bit wetter, a little bit wetter to the wettest area. As it grows out, it's it senses this water um, in a similar way as it would. If you took a dry sponge and, and put it on a tabletop and then there's water only touching one corner of that sponge, that's the corner that's going to absorb that water and expand. So it's kind of a similar mechanism that pulls these roots along. So it wants to go into this direction and maybe it sends out a couple of feelers to see which way is better for more water. Um, finding the water over here, this is what would elongate in, into here. This is a very simple um, illustration just to just to get the point across. It's not a scale model or anything. Same here. Uh, this is just a, a loose sketch, but I'm trying to show soil particles. Uh, microscopic soil particles here. Um, and in between we have pore space. And the way that the soil functions is you have uh, water that clings to the outside of the soil particles. Um, you know, like uh, like the surface tension that causes droplets to form like on the, again on a tabletop. It wouldn't just be perfectly distributed in a flat um, plane of water, but it lumps up into a droplet. Um, similar thing goes on so that you have the soil particles themselves covered in water. And then in here you have air. Um, and it's not perfectly evenly distributed, so on, on, on and then the soil changes over time. So on a wetter day, this might be totally full of water. Um, and as it gets drier and drier, it might be more or less totally full of air. Um, but that's what it looks like. You, you need space in between the particles uh, in order for that to to go on. So 
generally uh, where a tree wants to grow is going to be more like this. You know, we have a, we have rain coming down onto the surface of the soil. It wets this area first and then gravity pulls the, the water down through and it and it have, creates a soil gradient of some sort here, that, which would be much probably more complicated and influenced by more things than what this illustration seems to indicate. But if you go over here and you pave the top of it, not taking anything away, but just adding pavement. The water now doesn't have access to this, so. So what's the root going to be doing over there? The root has no business over there, so it's going to be wanting to be in this area more so than this area. So even though the soil's there, uh, it's just not terribly appealing to the tree. So you can see that oftentimes in street trees that the ha you have this sort of massing of of wood that comes up through the hole in the sidewalk. Um, because that's where the tree has is like forced to grow. It's almost like the tree is in a container. Also, the tree needs uh, the roots need air. Um, I'm not sure if I made a whole slide about that. I don't think so. So roots need air. Um, they breathe similar to us. Um, they're using they're using the uh, roots grow using cell division, which is driven by respiration which is the same way that animals metabolize energy and breathe and our cells divide by way of respiration. Um, so does a tree root because it doesn't have leaves on it. So it's taking the sugars and food that's that's been exported from the leaves. And when it gets down to the roots, um, it, it operates, it needs to absorb oxygen um from the surrounding soil and off gas co2 just like we do so this area underneath the pavement can really become packed up with co2 instead of air because it's not going to escape isn't the the gases can't exchange through this porous surface um so there's another issue. So it's it's an issue of water. It's an issue of air. And, you know, of course, we have soil compaction also. All right, so. This is kind of what I was getting at. There's not enough water to really attract the roots outwards. Um, and it's essentially growing in a container in a street tree and the roots can't really breathe. So as they can't breathe under here, that's why they're growing up in here. They're trying to get access to air and water. So just keeping those things in mind, it, it, it makes it pretty obvious why um, these trees look the way they do. I, I'm willing to bet that these were all planted on the same day, um, probably by the same people. They probably all had the same care after they were planted, um, but the big difference is the pavement. So we have a, uh, a few things that we've created as human beings to help deal with this uh, issue of pavement around trees. And one of them is called Cornell University Structural Soil or CU Structural Soil. Um, it's a trademarked patented uh, product. This is what it looks like. It's uh, not much to look at. It's just kind of a gravelly looking substrate. Um, but what it's attempting to do is maintain pore space even in a compacted state. So you can see this compactor is going around over it. They're going to pave over it after that. So the idea is that the rock matrix of these angular stones will um, completely hold the load bearing job of the soil. So that's going to make it structurally sound for the things that we need to do as humans like paving. So it's it's kind of like immune to compaction. Um, it doesn't solve the question of water coming down to it. So you may have better access of water kind of coming in through the more pervious, less compacted um, stone, but this the the structural soil in and of itself isn't spreading water around around in the in the area that the roots want to be so much. Um, 
this is a product also called Silva Cell, which is by Deep Root, a company called Deep Root. Um, this project here was in Burlington, uh, I believe, and it is. This is a basic, basic sketch of what it does. So again, we're separating out the um, load bearing job and the plant sustaining job. So the load bearing job in this case is being done not by stones, but by um, this plastic framing. So the plastic kind of like uh, stacked up milk crates um, allows the sidewalk to to be fully supported and you can drive trucks on it even stuff like that from what I understand. And uh, the soil inside the milk crates is is quite fluffy. Uh, it, you know, you compact it. I think you walk on it when you're when you're installing them, but uh, the compaction beyond that is is zero. So it's it's not compacted with a machine. It's just um, it's just kind of fluffy in there, and that's really nice for the tree. There's also in this installation, and I think it's recommended in in Silva cells in general is there's a some consideration being used to move water and air laterally through it um, so that it's not restricted just to the planting hole. So this is another patented product also. Now we're going to get into what they do in Stockholm here. Um, this is a picture of Bjorn Embrin. I don't know if Bjorn's in the, I invited him to this. I don't know if he's here, um, but the method that that he uses is is kind of more homemade in a way. You have uh, it's kind of open source. Um, we can use his method um, through our local locally sourced materials, um, and we've done that in Montpelier. Um, but yeah, he's he was a long long time tree officer of Stockholm, Sweden, where They've been using this method and and developing it and testing it in different ways in different places um, for almost 20 years, maybe a little more than 20 years at this point. So much of the work in here is not the, you know, I didn't invent this. Certainly, um, this is a lot of this is the is really the work of Bjorn Embrin and his team over there. So I want to give credit where credit is due, and I hope that the way that I referenced his work throughout is correct. And if not, I'll I'll fix it. But um, this came from one of his presentations here. This is a really good diagram or a summary of what it looks like or what the job is of each of these components of this design. I'll just go through it uh, one by one because they are numbered. So number one here is pavement same as any number two is a geotextile layer which is like a landscape fabric number three is a layer of crushed rock for infiltration of surface water and airing of the soil this is this is one of the parts of the project that i'm the most excited about uh it's just a bed of gravel but at the same time the um special considerations in the design allow it to be almost like the the surface of the forest floor in a way um, allowing air and water exchange um, throughout the soil so underneath that we have number four which is the structural soil so i i would still call this structural soil it's not it's not cu structural soil it's not trademarked but it's um still a structural soil um and this is generally used um, very similar to the CU structural soil in the way that it holds weight. But the medium of what the plant wants out of it is different. Um, CU structural soil is using a clay mixture along with a, a hydrogel that um, binds it together uh, while you're mixing it. So the stones are sort of coated in this like clay and gel mixture a little bit. And in this system, I'll show you a lot more about it, but we're using biochar in those gaps, uh, biochar and compost. So that brings us to 
number five that terrace i think that's bed i think that means is the word he's using for bedrock basically or just the the ground underneath that you're not working on um, number six is a planting box this is what allows you to compact the material around the outside of the tree while still leaving a space for the tree um, the seven is the tree itself eight is planting soil in here we have you can have fluffy loose soil here if you want. You can also have um, kind of a mixture of the biochar compost mix and then add um, some fine gravel. That would also be a good idea because that will also then hold the weight of your crate. Um, speaking of which, this is an iron grate here. Um, now this is another innovation from Stockholm that's uh, really important to the system. It's uh, called an infiltration chamber or a ventilation chamber, and it lets water and air move through the pavement. There's an iron grate over the top, and there are holes in the sides of this chamber which allow air and water to move through this open gravel. Um, so in here, in this layer of gravel, we're not we're not adding any biochar or compost. It's just pure gravel. And then this geotextile on the top of it is is there to keep it that way, keep it clean. So that when you pave over it, you don't get any fines clogging up this um, very porous layer. So at this point, you're probably wondering what biochar is if you don't know. Um, this is a microscope image of biochar. Uh, so it's waste biomass, um, which is harvested, not harvested for the purposes of being biochar. That would be um, that would be very carbon unfriendly if you did that. Um, so, but if you if you have a waste stream of biomass like uh, from a, from a sawmill, for example the bark and whatnot um that's that would be a good source or if you have corn stalks um human you know manure would be fine so then you're going to put that material through a process of pyrolysis which is heating it up it's it's basically like the evil twin of combustion kind of it's it's uh adding a lot of heat to it with in the absence of air the end result is that you're getting rid of all the extra things in that biomass and you're left with with a very high percentage of carbon. Um, so yes, I wanted to note that I'm speaking about biochar as a soil additive for street trees. I'm not advocating for it as a cure-all for climate change. I think that it may be part of the solution for for climate change and it may help in many ways because it, it can act as a carbon sink if you if you bury it in the soil which is what we're doing here so that's a good thing but i think it, a lot of it depends on how you produce it where it comes from and um uh other factors there's other better ways to deal with climate change so i wouldn't want to just be increasing emissions and then increasing biochar usage in order to make up for it um, I would want to be decreasing emissions and possibly getting some added benefit from from the biochar. So here's uh, four years after planting, and it's 3.5 meters from the tree. You can see the root growth under pavement after it's been dug up. Um, this is the Stockholm method. So this is just one of the really encouraging things that that I've seen. That all these fine roots here. Um, this is the infiltration layer or the, the clear gravel. Um, and then under here, we just have this matrix of multiple different types of, you know, well, we, this is where our structural soil is. And so under here, we have all this amazing root mass. And if we're 10 feet from the tree, more than 10 feet, I think, um, after just four years, that's that's to me really and really encouraging.
this isn't this is in close up of the Stockholm infiltration um, chambers. So you can see that compared to that diagram before you have these holes here. Once this is buried more, it'll be buried just like this in that clean stone. And over here you have the iron grate. Now this iron grate sits perfectly on top of here and it is the width of the concrete that you're going to pour for the sidewalk. So it's kind of shows you where that level will be and how thick that concrete is going to be. So they, they trust this method. This is not a passing phase in Stockholm. In in here, in this is a map of Stockholm. You can see the bright green lines are the planting beds that have been rebuilt using these specifications. Um, I think it's incredible that they've invested so much to be able to do that. Um, and it's a it's a major city, of course, and it's a very different place from Vermont. But um, at the same time, it's it's they've seen so much success with it and you can look through. I've, I've got links to Bjorn's other presentations. Um, they have photos and photos and photos of, of these trees just thriving in in these types of planting situations. In my pillar, on the other hand, we have almost five trees planted this way. You can see in bright green, this is where ours are. Uh, this pit is a little bit longer because there's two, two trees both sharing that space on opposite ends of that pit. Um, I'd love to expand into more, but at this point, I believe I'm going to start telling you more about our experience in um, in Montpelier. Um, this is what biochar and compost mixed together looks like. Biochar is essentially charcoal. Um, and compost is compost. So you mix that one to one ratio. Uh, it has to be wet and activated and nutritious when it goes into the into the ground for a tree. So biochar has a kind of a strange um, liability that comes along with it, which is that it. The reason why it's so good is it's really it's really a mechanism of soil structure. Um, it's not so much a mechanism of nutrient. It's it's devoid. It's all carbon, so it's really it's really nutrient um, depleted, really. Um, but the structure of it is so complex and has so much surface area, um, as you saw in that picture before, that it can hold tons of water. It maintains pore space. It's hard to compact it, and it's extremely durable underground. So. Um, you're getting your soil structure from your biochar. It holds a ton of water. So what you're, you're also really benefiting your uh, stormwater goals by employing this method. But in order to activate it, you, you have to mix it in advance with your char, with your compost. Um, and it's good to get it wet so that some microbial action can begin in the, in the char. So if you put just dry brand new biochar down into uh, a tree pit with a tree, you could kill the tree because it can um, suck the moisture out of the roots just because it's got that much absorption ability. So don't do that. Um, biochar can also be alkaline. Uh, so in this case, we tested the pH of the biochar and the, and the pH of the compost. And then we decided to add some peat to it in order to make it more neutral because trees typically like a neutral pH. So now here we are at the job site on Main Street in Montpelier. Um, a lot of these photos are by John Snell, Montpelier's uh, chair of the tree board. And as I often refer to him, the greatest human being in America. Um, this, is, this is showing how we marked out the places where we are going to plant the trees. So this X, that's where the tree will be. And this is the outline of the sidewalk that's going to be removed in order to fill it back in for the tree. 
So you want to you want to call dig safe. Um, so that's really how it starts. It starts with the conversation with some paint on the sidewalk. And it really starts to feel real once you once you put the paint there. So you call dig safe. They come and find your white paint and they'll send some people out to come look at it and let you know what's underground. They use both maps and, and metal detectors. Um, this is a blue marking that says OK. That indicates that um, the city of Montpelier's water department has come out and and verified that this area should be OK to dig. In terms of water pipes, and so then the electricity people or the natural gas pipe people will come also. Even with dig safe ha having come, uh, you can never guarantee that you won't find more stuff under there that so you should always dig carefully. Next, we have to cut the sidewalk. So this is something that I think is really nice. And it's a nice preparatory um, step to take when you're building one of these, because as you can see, this sidewalk is is fully cut, ready to be removed. Um, but it poses no hazard of any sort. Um, it takes, I think it took the crew, the street crew, like an hour maybe to do that, maybe less, probably less. Um, so you don't even need to call dig safe because you can just set the saw blade to the depth of the pavement. And so you're not going to be cutting anything under there. Um, and by the way, some of the seams in the sidewalk that you see are actually seams where the concrete doesn't connect. And some of them are just sort of false seams that, that they imprint on the surface of the of the sidewalk. So I don't know. I just thought that was that was interesting when I found out about that. So then this mini excavator here is prying out each chunk of sidewalk. Easy peasy. Um, and then they th throw it in this truck and the truck drives it away. Now look how thin this pavement is. I find it incredible to think about. You know, it looks like the most, it looks like stone. It looks like you're on a mountaintop where the bedrock goes all the way down and and there's no way through a piece of pavement. But if you look at it, it's like. It's like a layer of plaster on the top of the soil. Um, once you cut it and remove it, it's really not so intimidating. So this is our depth of our hole. It was about four feet on this one. This is another tree board member, James, and that's me. This is um, the beginnings of our skeletal or structural soil. These rocks are relatively uniformly sized. Um, these are granite and there's lots of pore space in between them. You can see where it's really deep shadow around the rocks. That's all gonna be full of biochar and compost and water and air. So this is what our pile of stone looks like out there, this nice granite. So the operator here, Dan, would would reach into the truck, grab the stone and lay it in load by load, as you can see in a very orderly fashion here. So it's pretty quiet, honestly, it's pretty quiet and people can walk right by while he's doing it outside the cones. Then a truck full of the biochar mix comes in and backs up to the excavator and the same process is repeated, sprinkling this biochar compost mix on the top of the stones. Then we um, used a pressure washer. I recommend not doing that, but we sprayed water on it um, to get it to absorb down in, in the poor spaces of the rock. And this is the first time we had tried this, any of us, so we didn't know quite what to expect with this process. This was kind of nerve wracking to think we we're standing in a hole doing this for multiple layers of stone and, and taking a long time and you know for good reason it did take a long time and I, I wouldn't do it this way again um as you can see that it's really splashing around um if you can see those particles flying up and you can see on the edges of the hole it's like splashing up on the sides instead of going downwards so uh let me see it there you go so we ended up just switching to this a regular garden hose um, worked quite a bit better and you can see that like it's almost like you're looking down into a pond. 
and you can see some rocks shining through the surface. It's kind of ended up being better. And I was also just raking it around, and as you rake it and agitate it, it kind of jiggles its way down into the uh, rock also. This is fully compacted as we go, each layer. Um, Dan would compact it with this, and then we would compact it with the walk behind tamper. This is fertilizer that was also sprinkled in there. So this is a precaution against that issue with biochar. We don't want it to be um, we don't want it to to be absorbing things in competition with the roots. But this is a slow release uh, fertilizer. You basically want to use a slow release fertilizer um, with any with any tree. Um, yeah. So the water carries the mix down into this into the soil structure, into the stone structure. It takes a lot of water. It takes a long time. <laughs> These uh, are our version of the ventilation chambers. We always seem to call them side wells for some reason, but that's we we put in two per tree. Um, they're made of sewer pipe. They were cut to length, and then these holes are all drilled by hand. Um, you know, with a drill, but so they have they'll have iron drain covers over them when the sidewalk is in place. So this is now going to help deal with that hydrotropism issue. We're going to be able to put some stuff on the edges of this um, pit. That's that's you know put some water over there that's going to actually attract roots along a moisture gradient and once the roots spread out they can you know that that's one of the advantages of being an, an established mature tree is with a bigger more established root system you can um shop around whatever you want is under there and so if you if you need more moisture one day you might be able to reach it with one root if you need more air maybe you can reach it with a different root um so once the root once the root structure is bigger, the tree will be okay. The ventilation chamber again over here is the one from Stockholm, uh, and this is the one here just to be, put them side by side so you can compare. Um, I believe, based on what I see here, there's a weld there, uh, and this fits perfectly on top of that. Um, my my belief is that that is a custom built. Um, metal piece that they either contract out to be fabricated for them just for this purpose or something like that um, and this is also like a specialized grate just for it so it's more again they've been doing it for a long time over there um, and they want it to be easy another aspect of this planting method is the planting box um, in our case we just used plywood uh, this is four feet by four feet uh, square, two feet tall. So you can make one box out of one sheet of plywood. Um, these gaps in it, they steer the roots downwards into, into the soil mix rather than into the pavement. So now we can place the tree in here without having to, you know, fully fill this pit and then dig it out again in order to plant the tree. So this just saves us a spot for the tree to go while we're building it. In Stockholm, they they use um, concrete. Um, this needs a photo credit. That's from Bjorn Embrin also. Um, one of his presentations, I'll add that after the slide shows over. But um, this is their box that I, I, I would prefer because this is a load bearing uh, material so they can place this um, in the ground make sure that it's level with the sidewalk that they're going to build and then that square there fits perfectly with the square tree grate that's that they use so once they put the grate on they can just pour the concrete all up to the sides of it and and it's all it's all done we had to do quite a bit of finagling to get our, our grates around the tree because they were a different shape and size than this is. Also, I wouldn't want to rest a grate on that really. Um, 
because as this rots and stuff, we're not going to be too happy about that. So here we are, we're almost ready to, we're re almost ready, no, in this case, we're just about ready to uh, plant, no, to put the sidewalk on, to put the concrete on. So this is the infiltration layer, this clean, shiny stone. Um, underneath the, these two cones there and there, that's where those side wells are. Um, this is, of course, where the tree will be. So this whole area gives you gives you a sense of what amount of root space this tree is going to have. Now it's time to put the tree in. Oh, so over here you can see we've got um, the concrete is now there. I, I think I have a better picture of that elsewhere. There you go. So here's here's here it is covered up. So that's what the iron grate looks like on it. Um, this is what the iron grate looks like on the side well. So this is a honey locust bald and burlap. This is a mini crane. A lot of trucks have these, or a lot of towns, I think, have those. So using that to move around bald and burlap tree is pretty slick. Um, one side note about it, though, is you have to, you can't hook around the trunk of the tree. You'd, you'd hike, hook around the metal basket. Um, let me see if I have, I don't know if I have a picture of that. Yeah, so you can see I have a strap going to the basket there and there. And then I've got the crane hooked up to the strap up out of frame there. Um, so we're going to hoist it out of here. And place it in the hole. Um, that's Alec Ellsworth, tree warden of Montpelier. This is me at that time, city arborist. And this is the tree. So here we have looking pretty good. You know, I feel like that's pretty satisfying to look at that. So we want to make sure our planting depth is right. Similar to any other tree, we want to make sure that we have this, um, tr this stem centered not only centered in this box, the, this being centered in the box actually doesn't matter. Having it centered in the what's going to be the hole that it comes through in the grate does matter. So that's one reason why I would like to be using a concrete box here is because that's the same thing and it just doesn't take as much thinking at the time. You have to, whenever you're planting ball and burlap tree, you have to remove the wire basket. And for anyone who has never done that, I just really wanted to share uh, the way that I like to do it, because once you know, you, it's it's much easier. So it's important to cut the bottom off of the basket before you plant the tree, before you stand the tree up. So here we have these the wire basket used to be continuous all throughout the bottom of the tree. So you go around the outside of the basket, cut, 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 cut all those wires that come down and cut them at the same level. Then you take a sharp knife and you cut along here and the other line. So you can cut the burlap and then just tear it back. So you have these sort of corners tearing back. Then when you set this tree upright, you still have a lot of the support of this wire basket so that you can use it to handle the tree without damaging it. But, you know, you don't have Later, you don't have to pull the wire basket out from underneath it somehow. So once you have the tree stood up, you then will cut, cut, cut along those X's, and then it opens up like uh, peeling birch bark off of a tree, which, of course, we would never do. But here we go. We've got the watering crew here, uh, tree board members who are fantastic. Um, taking care of this newly planted tree. This is a different tree, by the way, but still. Um, you can see this air gap underneath here. Um, I would have, in the future, filled this all the way up with gravel, all the way up to the bottom of the iron, I think, to support the weight, because those can break when a uh, sidewalk plow drives on it. So here's the tree this winter. Um, you can see its location and how it's sort of functioning within the sidewalk. It's pretty normal looking street tree at this point. Over here we have have it from another view. You can see that it has a good shape. It's not um, 
struggling. It's uh, I wish I had a, co a picture of it from the summer, but it does have a nice crown when it's when it's leafed out. And I'd like to compare that to another tree, which I lost the slide for us. OK, this is um, a swamp white oak, which is near this tree. This tree was planted at least by me. Thanks. You know, I'm not criticizing anyone else's work here. It was planted. Um, probably five years ago, and this was planted two to three years ago. Um, and what I, I guess that this picture is trying to show the elongation um, from year to year, and I, it was hard to get the lighting right. I'm not such a good photographer, but you can see that the twigs are just elongating rapidly on this one, and this tree is overall taller than, than the swamp white oak is. Um, and the twigging on this is just more stubby, less elongation, more thickening. So all in all, this tree that uh, in five years has grown less than this tree has in two. So I would say that so far our, our experience in Montpelier has been a major success. Um, but of course, you're all probably curious about how much it costs to do it. Um, these are rough estimates. I want to really drive that home. If you, you need, you're going to need to do your own homework if you want to think about uh applying this this methodology um but these are rough estimates per cubic yard um so this does not these numbers don't account for um the sidewalk getting created or the iron grates that you use or the cost of the tree um this is just the, the filling in product so for the silver cell you might be looking at 30 378 to $486 per cubic yard installed um, for the structural soil, possibly 40 to $75 per cubic yard at your cheapest one. Um, your granite biochar compost mix is approximately $175 per cubic yard, so somewhere in the middle. So the implications of what 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 is the point of this? You know, like this doesn't mean you should go out and start paving in your yard so you can plant a tree in the pavement in your yard. If you have the ability to plant a tree with no pavement at all, then that's by far the better option. But in places where you need to have pavement, this is going to allow us to basically put a tree wherever you want. Um, you could plant trees that are in the middle of a parking lot in order to give shade to that parking lot that are going to be healthy um, beneficial trees. You could plant trees in front of downtown buildings to shade the fronts and create outdoor spaces that are more livable. Um, so there there those are some of the places where we see the greatest inequity in in access to tree canopy is places where there's already a lot of pavement. Those the people who need to go there probably might not have just because of income. They might not have the option to go other places with more canopy. Um, they might not be able to drive out into the country. Or whatever, they might not be able to shop at a different store. So things like grocery stores, playgrounds, libraries, places that are really for the public. I, I would love to see some of these being done. I would also love to see some people starting to dig around an existing tree. Fill it in with some biochar and stone mix. Add your infiltration layer around it. No reason you couldn't do that. Uh, we can begin to use our urban forest as a cyclical um, carbon cycle. Because the trimmings and the tree work and the tree care and the leaf cleanup that comes from your urban forest can then be used to fuel a biochar production. And then it can be used to plant the new trees. If one implication that I see is, you know, in Vermont, there's a lot in, in towns in Vermont, there are a lot of places where we do have a green strip or a lawn along the side of the road. And then there's like people's yards on the other side of the sidewalk from there. So if you could just make a channel under the sidewalk 
that uh, connects that tree to the lawn on the other side of the sidewalk, that tree basically has unlimited root space now. Um, seeing earlier slides about how the, you know, the impact of, of air and water that comes from pavement, you know, this could steer you, even if, even if you don't want to try going for the biochar whole shebang, it, it can maybe steer you towards having some less pavement or maybe some permeable pavers that are going to distribute water and allow some air exchange uh, around your trees. Um, I also really want to see in the future working together with street departments because this is a heavy construction project um, and tr tr downtown trees, trees that are around pavement. Um, you can't go out with a shovel and just, just put one in, you know, it's not going to work. So this is something that takes quite a bit of collaboration and, and relationship building. Um, takes quite a bit of equipment and tools and probably the the people who are best suited to help you with it are, are people who who plow those same streets and um, build those same sidewalks. Another implication for bio for biochar would be if you have district heat, um, if you're making electricity with biomass, such as they do in Burlington at McNeil plant, or if you make maple syrup, those are all things that you could use at, uh, make alongside biochar. Um, and again, I already talked about that. Those are the trees before they were planted. Oh, there we go. That's the same photo earlier that I needed to put a credit for. There's the credit for it. In the future, I would recommend mixing the stone and the char and the compost together in advance. So you can see how these stones are totally coated with biochar. They've been mixed mechanically using like a, a big loader, just kind of have a pile of stone and you have a pile of biochar and you just kind of mash them together with the loader um, until it looks like this. That's what I would do in the future. It would be much faster to construct it on site. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to put out some acknowledgments. Thank you to John Snell for the use of your photos. Thank you to Bjorn Embrin for making these resources that can be duplicated around the world. Uh, thank you, April Shaw of the Vermont State Library for locating so much of Bjorn's work for me to review. Thank you, Elise Shadler, for your guidance and use of your photos. Um, and thanks to Dan, Greg, and Albert of Montpelier DPW for constructing these with the equipment. Um, and there's some more, there's a slide full of, uh, full of links to, this is what April Shaw gave me, all these different references that you could read or view. Most of what Bjorn has created for his body of work is um, presentations. He doesn't have a lot of um, written publication. So a lot of these are slideshows that you can look or YouTube videos. But that, as they say, is that. <laughs> Thanks, Ads. Uh, we got a couple of questions in here. And for those of you uh, who may have joined after and you are ISA, just make sure to stick your um, number in there. I'm keeping track of those with your name. Um, gosh, OK, so let's go back here. Uh, there's a comment in here that popped up from Donna, who did have to leave, but she actually is from Green State Biochar. I don't know if that's who you worked with. Um, she just said, sidewalk or not, I would not think of planting a tree without the addition of biochar. She mm -hmm. put her um, website in there. And then she did have a question she had to leave, but um, she wondered how uh, the trees fared with the July flood. For those of you who are not from Vermont, uh, we had some pretty gnarly flooding that happened in July. Downtown Montpelier was entirely underwater uh, for a day or two. Um, so I don't know, Ads, if you have thoughts on that and also wondered if you had a lab analysis of the biochar, specifically the number of hard carbon or percent of hard carbon. I do not have that um, lab analysis, but the flood question, uh, the trees did fine, I'll say. The trees did fine. 
Um, Anne, hi Anne. Oh, really? Sorry, just, let me go back. Oh, the yeah. the um, the side wells or the the ventilation pits did get kind of clogged up with um, muck from the flood, which would be great to go back and clean out with uh, Vactor. Is what it's called. It's a good water based suction based uh, excavation tool that the city has. Um, Anne asked, what fuel is biochar typically heated with? Uh, you Well, it's also usually typically heated with other biomass. So you have the wood that starts the reaction um, in a chamber on the outside, and then you have the wood that's turning into, into biochar in a chamber on the inside. So the heat generally comes from additional biomass. But there's you, any heat source will do it. That's one of the issues with... Um, I think I think that first initial hurdle of, of starting that um, fire essentially is the that's the hurdle why like if you're using a waste stream of, of of biomass you can end up carbon negative on biochar if you go and harvest trees that one that when you put everything in the same equation you're you're going to be carbon sad carbon sad. Uh, Chris Olson, who seems to know a lot about biochar, is also on the call or on the webinar, and he put some information in here about um, the type of kiln used, a top load updraft kiln, um, and then the stirred material heats the biochar until it begins to off gas. The gas ignites, um, creating heat that further pyrolyzes the material. Um, so thanks, Chris, for that. And then one last question before we, we wrap up from Erica. Um, does the waste wood from tree pruning removals in Montpelier go to biochar? What happens to the waste wood in Montpelier? That's such a good question. Um, the waste wood in Montpelier, we do not make our own biochar in Montpelier. I mean, we have a, we have a population of 8,000 um, going through major floods and, and whatnot. We Not high on the list to start, construct, start making biochar. There are other people, uh, I think one of them have, was here in this presentation earlier, who are in Vermont making biochar, which is at where we sourced our biochar for this project. Um, the current use of the wood waste is, um, the current use of the wood waste is, we chip it um, and we use it to mulch trees. So it's kind of a similar carbon cycle in a way. Um, we use it to mulch our, farm at times um when the, but this farm also got washed away in the flood unfortunately um i'm not sure what else i can say i'm sorry the, the notifications are really distracting me is there a way to mute them <laughs> um no <laughs> uh, oh. the what the chats yeah yeah well so if you have a question please put it in but maybe Go easy on on it if you're not asking a question. I don't know if I answered that last question fully or not. Yeah, uh, you mulch. Um, then just the we are at ten, so I'll just go through these quickly. Um, Alec from Montpelier, hi Alec, did chime in. He said uh, they found a nice alternative product for the wooden planting box for the next round of tree wells, and that is a it's a plastic concrete form made for setting parking meters, lights, etc. And he got it from EJ Prescott. So that's, that's great awesome. to hear for the next round. And then the last question we'll take is from Darren. Hey Darren, uh, CCRPC, the Regional Planning Commission. Great presentation. You showed a picture of roots below the structural soil. How did they get underneath it? Did they go through the structural soil? Those were, <clears throat> let me go back. Can I show, share my screen again? Yes, you may. There's my. All right, so. Those roots were in this layer here. Um, am, can you see my cursor there? Or no? Uh, yeah, um, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so those were, roots were in here. So they, they come out and they, they grow kind of mostly in here. Roots can also grow in here, in this layer too. But um, by and large, they're growing in this layer. So they're just coming continuously from the tree out through the gaps in the planting box.
and then they're reaching out into the structural soil from there. Got it. Thanks. Great. All right, we are over time, so we're going to wrap it up. Um, thanks again for everybody for being here. Uh, thank you, Adam, for such a great presentation. And uh, we will have the webinar recorded. Um, we'll probably put it up on our YouTube page. Uh, so if you have other folks that you want to see it, then you can direct them there. And uh, thanks all, and have a great Thursday. Bye. Thanks a lot.